There we go. All right, so the book of Titus, if you look at your title page, a uh, small book, it is um, three chapters. The author is, of course, Paul. You know, we've been, we've been discussing Paul's writings now for several months. And um, this is the last of the pastoral uh, letters that he wrote. Do you remember the other two? First and second Timothy. He is writing those to the new pastor of the church in Ephesus when he writes to Timothy. This is the third and final of what is called or labeled in Paul's writings, the pastoral letters. And um, this is going to be the book to Titus, who we're going to find out is very similar to Timothy in the situation that's going on in his life. Written around 62, 64 AD, somewhere in there. Again, we can't be totally specific. We do know two things. We know that it was written when Paul was in his first imprisonment. That's the, the one that was a little nicer to him. He had a house and he was able to, he was under house arrest, and he was able to have people come and go during that time. That would be when Paul actually um, wrote this. It was also written at the same time as Colossians because we find out that Paul is going to send the letter to Titus along with the letter to the Colossians. And so those are going to go at the same time. The theme is leading and living in grace. And the key verse is 2.14. He who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. All right, so if you go to the next page, you'll see there's a little outline to the book of Titus. What you're going to find as we go through this lesson today is that the majority of this, or at least a lot of it, is um, a repeat of Timothy. So um, let's find out, first of all, just a little bit about Titus, and then we'll talk about what Paul needs to tell him. Titus, in the first chapter, of uh, verse 5, it tells us that Paul and Titus had previously worked together establishing churches throughout the island of Crete. If you look on your little map, this might be interesting to you, down here on the little map that I gave you, at the very bottom, there's some old red lines down there. That's the little island of Crete. See down at the bottom? This is at the bottom of your page on that one. Um, and this is just a small little tiny island, the island of Crete, outside of um, uh, some of the other areas. And this is going to be where all the action is going to take place for this particular book. But Titus has been with Paul for a great deal of time. We find out in some of the other books that he was actually there during the Acts 15 um, event where Paul goes to... Peter and James and says, hey, what is this thing about saying that new Christians, new believers who are Gentiles have to be circumcised and go under the law? That's not the free grace of God that, I, that I'm preaching in my gospel. And Titus was with him during that time. We're not told that in Titus, but we're told in other writings that Titus was one of the people that was with him at that time. And so later on, Paul is even going to say um, Timothy was circumcised, but Titus, who was with him at the time, was not told that he needed to be circumcised. So Paul was able to clarify that with the examples of Timothy and Titus at that time. Um, Paul goes to Crete. It's a very busy, busy island. Lots of, <coughs> lots of uh, uh, cities throughout this small little town. And he works with him there on Crete for a short period of time. And then Paul needs to leave and do some other work. And when he leaves, he's going to, much like with Timothy in Ephesus, he's going to leave Titus there to oversee all of the work mm -hmm. that he's done. And he tells him that uh, he is going to establish order within those churches. In fact, he tells him in chapter 1, verse 5, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. And here's what he wants him to do. Appoint elders in every city, in every congregation of every city. Now, why would that be one of the most important things that he wants to have Titus do? Because if you've ever been in a congregation without leadership, it's not good. No. <laughs> you need to have 
of someone in leadership who is leading the church in the appropriate ways. And so this huge responsibility that Paul is giving Titus is not only um, to be in charge of these churches and stuff, but he's going to give him directive on the type of men, the characteristics that these men must have, and the type of men that he wants to be placed into leadership in these churches. Now, guess what? These people are not going to be voted in. These people are not going to, you know, just uh, volunteer for the job and say, I will do it. Titus actually, under the authority of the direction of Paul, is going to go and select the men based on the characteristics that we read about in Timothy. They're going to be repeated here. Those are the men that Titus will take and appoint to be the elders, and, and sometimes in this book it's called bishops, same, same word, um, to lead the congregation. Question for you is, can you see a huge difference that occurs when one man under the direction and the guidelines of what it is that we're looking for in leadership is given the authority to appoint versus a bunch of people voting for someone to be put into leadership? Can you see how that's a kind of a different standard? Um, the idea of voting leadership in is, is, is honestly very American, and, and it's very popular in our churches, and, and we do it here, and I'm not saying that it's wrong. Don't, I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm saying it's kind of a different philosophy on how we go about appointing people, because Paul says, here are the characteristics of the men who should lead you. Now go and find them, and when you find them, appoint them. And then once they are appointed and anointed into that position, they receive the blessing of the Lord to lead that congregation. It's really kind of a cool plan. Um, so he tells him that they are going to set in order the things that are lacking. The term set in order is an interesting one because it's actually a medical term. And it's the term that you use when you break a bone. And you set a crooked bone in order, you make it straight. You make it, you bring it back. And that's the term that he uses when he says you're going to set in order. We're going to find out why. The reason why he has to go in and set things in order is because the people in Crete are a very difficult bunch to corral. <laughs> Extremely difficult. And so he's going to have um, a lot of job there to do. Now, Paul is in, oh, I already told you that. He's in Rome during his first imprisonment there, and he's going to send the letter when he sends the letter uh, to the Colossians. It's a personal letter. It's a letter directly written to Titus the man. However, it would have been very well known that that letter would have been read aloud in as many congregations as it could have been passed off to, and that many, many people would have read it. So while the instruction was directly to Titus in how to run the church in, uh, in Crete, in all the congregations in the island of Crete, it was also a general letter for believers to understand how things were going to be done. Um, we do know a few things about Titus, not necessarily from the book of Titus. Most of the things that we know about him, interestingly, are from 2 Corinthians. If you go throughout the book of 2 Corinthians, Titus is mentioned many times, numerous times there. We do know that he was, a tr uh, Paul calls him a true son of the faith. Okay, who else did he call a son of the faith? Timothy. Timothy, in exactly the same way. Biblical scholars do not believe that Titus was quite as young as Timothy. He may have been a younger man, but not the teenage that boy that uh, Timothy was when he connected with Paul. And so he was a true son of the faith. He was a partner. He was a fellow worker with Paul. It appears that he worked with him when he uh, worked in the tent business and did things. So he worked alongside him in every area. He was with him as he went through the various uh, churches and the, uh, that we've read about in our Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all of the letters that we've read. He was with him there. He's been mentored under Paul in every single circumstance. Uh, it's told that he walked in the same spirit as Paul. That certainly would seem reasonable if he was mentored by him. 
right? You're going to walk in the spirit of the people who mentor you. He, it says that he walked in the same steps as Paul in 2 Corinthians. It tells us in the same steps. What does that mean? He lived a life similar to what Paul did, and that was try not to be a burden wherever you go, try to focus people on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the true life-changing thing that happens, and so that's where all of the focus goes. And so because of that information that we read about in those other books, in chapter 2 of Titus, we recognize that Paul can say that Titus could be a pattern for other believers. I thought about that a little bit, and I thought, can you imagine mm -hmm. having someone say, she's a pattern mm -hmm. for believers. This is who you want to be like, this person right here. Can you imagine what that would feel like to have people say that about you? Mm -hmm. This is a pattern. Follow after this. It's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And yet Titus, as a younger man, it is uh, told that he is a pattern for other believers. So three little chapters, um, much of the same direction that he gives to Timothy in regards to choosing <coughs> leaders. You're going to be very familiar. He tells him, do not uh, choose men that are based on their natural giftedness that they have. Don't choose men based on their education or their personalities or if they're good charitable givers. Uh, those are not the characteristics that you are going to look for. Instead, you're going to look for men who are blameless, good stewards, have a good reputation in the community, lead their own families well, not to be self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. They need to be hospitable to others. That's one that I think gets left out a lot. They need to like to open up their homes and their, and their places to people, strangers, and, uh, and believers both to come in. They need to be hospitable with what they have. A lover of good, sober-minded, self-controlled, just, and holy. Those are the characteristics that he is supposed to look for. Do you think it's easy to find people like that? No, it's not. But when you find one of them, then Titus, go and select them because these are the type of men who need to lead the church. He also reminds him of a very important one, and that is that they need to be able to teach God's word, rightly dividing the word. The doctrine uh, is supposed to both encourage and exhort, but it's also supposed to convict those who are coming in with false teaching. How do you know someone is teaching false doctrine if you don't know what their doctrine is? You know, you need to be pretty sure so that when someone comes in with something else, the people who are in charge of you can go, ah, wait a minute, that's, that's not the sound doctrine that we teach you. And you can't stop it if you don't know it. Paul was very concerned about the false teachers, as he is in all of his letters. And sadly, um, the biggest concern was among the Jewish teachers who were beginning to, by this time in the 60s, Christianity has had 25 years or more in the door, and they're beginning to get sick of it. So they've tolerated it up to the point of, okay, you guys, if, as long as you're following things and remaining Jew, you know, Jewish, and you're still coming to the important events, the tabernacle and Passover, and doing the things that you need to do, we'll tolerate this fringe group of Judaism. We'll tolerate that. Now 25 years has gone by and it appears that this is not going the way that they planned. First of all, did you know they're allowing Gentiles to come in? <laughs> Gentiles! I'm telling you, Gentiles. And they don't have to be circumcised and they don't have to follow the law of Moses. And so that's, that irks them to no end. Mm -hmm. And so by this time, they are coming in and attempting to take all of these people who have gone down the wrong path and bring them back into Judaism. So, of course, in all of his letters, Paul is very concerned that these are the people that are coming in, stirring the pot on what it is that he is trying to teach them. Now, um, in fact, it's really interesting because in Titus, he, he literally tells uh, uh, Titus, he says, their mouths need to be stopped. <laughs> in other words, you need to shut them up. 
Why? Because if they're allowed to continue to speak, they are going to influence people. You cannot let a lie continue to be spread. We t have a tendency oftentimes to say, you know, each person has the right of freedom of speech and people can say what they need to say and all of that. But if you're in charge of a group of people and someone is lying and you don't correct that lie and you don't stop it, then that lie will get a foothold. If not with everybody, with a group of the, with some of the people. And so it is the job of a good leader to stop uh, someone from coming in and continually spreading false doctrine. Paul knew the group that Titus was going to be working with. The people of Crete were not an easy people. It's so funny because one of their own writers, one of their own prophets in Crete had written something uh, that said, Cretans are liars and cheats and gluttons with uh with one of the worst oh wait a second in fact um the people of crete were uh liars evil beasts and lazy gluttons this came from their own people so if your own people are saying that about you then you know that you have a reputation out there paul did not say Cretans are liars and cheat in gluttons with one of the worst reputations of any group in the Roman Empire. Why don't you leave Crete and look for a better group of people to work with? Because <laughs> that's kind of our natural instinct. If this is a bad group of people, maybe there are a lot of ex-druggies or homeless or, uh, you know, they, have, they come with a lot of baggage or whatever, that's not an easy group of people to work with. Maybe we'll just leave them for someone else and we'll go over here and work with all the pretty people, you know, over here. That's not what Paul tells him. He doesn't say, look, look for a better teachable group. Instead, I love it, what he tells Titus is he says, I know how bad they are. I know how bad they are. Now you go out and change them by the power of Jesus Christ. That's your job. You go out and change them for the power of Jesus Christ and his glory, and that's how we're going to make a difference. Because if you don't present the gospel to the worst, how will anything ever get better? Isn't that the ministry of Jesus? He didn't go to all the pretty people. He didn't go to all the religious people. He didn't go to all the good people. He didn't go to those. That's because they didn't need a doctor, right? Isn't that what he said? They have no need of a physician. He went to the ones that needed the work, the people that are hard. And Paul tells them, you're going to stay there and do the work because these are the ones that need you. They need you, and it's not going to be easy. But how are you going to make the biggest difference? Are you going to go in there and change the government? Are you going to go in there and change all the things that need to be done in there? Are you going to go in there and change their social customs? Are you going to go in there and make them politically correct? No, that's not your job. Your job is to go in there and teach them about Jesus Christ. And when you teach them about Jesus Christ, you're going to change them one liar, one glutton at a time. You're going to change them. So um, <clears throat> Paul encourages Titus to remember, now this is a really interesting statement that he makes. He says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, for even their minds and consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but in their works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. All right, so that, I underlined it in my note here. They profess to know God, but in their works, they deny him. One of the biggest issues that Christianity has had from the very beginning, from the beginning of the foundation of Christianity until today. Uh, just as I've shared with you that Jewish people really don't have a major problem with Jesus Christ because they don't know very much about Jesus Christ. I think I've shared with you before, they don't, many of them don't even know that he was Jewish. And so they don't have a big problem with Jesus Christ. 
What they have a problem with are Christians. Christians who have come and persecuted them throughout the centuries for their faith. And for those who have stood under the banner of cross, of the cross and done horrible, despicable things. That's why they don't like Christianity. Not because of Jesus, but because of his followers. And so those are the ones who profess to know God, but deny him in their works. Do we not see that today? Some of the people who have the biggest megaphones are the ones who are spreading lies and conspiracies, are the ones who are leading their people down a pathway that is not correct, who are taking their the, the very people that God has <coughs> placed in their, um, you know, under their leadership and are, and are taking them in a direction that God would never have them go. They profess to know God, but they deny him in their works. Or the ones who wouldn't miss a Sunday service, like to sit in the front row, <laughs> even wear a tie, <laughs> and then go out and yell at the clerk when they go to the store, or are rude to the waitress on their Sunday lunch, or yelling at their kids all the way to church about something silly, or honking the horn and saying a few choice words to the guy who's driving too slow in front of them. Those are simple little things, but come on, guys. We cannot profess to know Jesus Christ and deny him in the way that we live. Deny him in our works. That, that goes against everything that he would have. And he says these are disqualified for every good work. In the, in the Greek, the word is um, odokimos is how you pronounce it. And it's used in several ways. It's used to describe a counterfeit coin. Counterfeit coin is disqualified as a means of money. It's no good. It was used to describe a cowardly soldier who did something wrong on the battlefield. He would be disqualified, no longer able to serve in the military. It was used to describe a candidate who had been rejected from office for doing something corrupt in, in, in office. He would have been disqualified from ever serving in office again. Lastly, I thought this was interesting. It was used of a stone that the contractors would look at as they were building the foundations for a building. And if the stone had definite deep flaws in it and they knew that it would not be steady for a building, they would put an A on it for this, for this particular word, odokimus, and they would set it aside because it was not fit to be used in building the foundation of that building. It was tagged, rejected set aside and not used. And he says, those who profess to know God and yet deny him in their works, they're disqualified. We need to put a big A on them and take them over here and set them aside. Because you know what? You can do more damage if the things that you do are in the name of Jesus Christ than if you just went out there and lived your own life the way you choose to live it, and not drag him down with you. Yourself for good works by those things. Chapter 2, he gives in very clear instruction on how to teach the different groups in the congregation. He, his main job is to instruct them in sound doctrine. Isn't that the job of a pastor always? Uh, they're to use the wisdom and experience of the believers to teach the young ones, those who are less experienced uh, or, or have had less time as believers in godly living. So he tells them the older men are to train and mentor the young men. Wow, that's a, that's a great thing, isn't it? Don't you love it when you see groups where older men take a young man under their wing and sort of train them? My husband has been involved in teamworks here in our community. It's a mentoring service, and it's uh, it's, it's men, and they, they, they bring them out of the churches um, who, will, who connect up with a an at-risk child early on. Some of these kids, 9, 10, 11 years old, uh, who don't have a fatherly figure in their lives, and they connect with them and 
just take them to coffee and, or not coffee, I guess you wouldn't do that. Take them to lunch and take them, you know, take them to play miniature golf and do all kinds of things with them just to spend time with them. You cannot build the foundation of a young person if, you don't, if they don't have someone to look up to, to pattern themselves after you. If you knew that someone was patterning their life after you, would you do anything differently? If you knew that there was a young person that watched you every time you were at church or every time they saw you in a family gathering or every time you, they saw you out and about, if you knew that person looked to you, is there anything that you would do differently? Because somebody's looking. Somebody's watching. Someone's watching us all the time and looking at the things that we do and say. And so he says the older men are to gather together the young men and mentor them up. And the older women are to gather the younger women and mentor them up. Teach them, um, teach them how to be good mothers and good wives and good, good uh, leaders in their household and how to organize a household, how to be godly mothers, how to train up their children in the Lord. Not everyone is born with that nurturing instinct. Some people are, and that's amazing and wonderful, but some people aren't. They need someone to pattern themselves after. And so maybe they're looking at you. And maybe they say, that's what I want to be. And Paul says, make sure that your older men and your older women know that. And they're leading the kind of lives that they can bring the younger people behind. He also brings up the fact of servants who are to be obedient to their masters. Do you remember how many times we've talked about that? Servants and masters in Paul's writings. It's really amazing. And I bring that up because when we get to Philemon, it's going to be an important part of our story there. And so I want you to just kind of put that in the back of your mind and remember, how many times has Paul mentioned servants, be obedient to your masters, just as if you were working for the Lord. And the way that we generally use that in our language is no matter what you're doing, whatever job you have at home or at an outside of the home job or whatever it is, whatever you're doing, do it as if you were doing it for the Lord. Give it your best, 100%, always doing the, the best that you can do as if you were working for the Lord. Don't steal time. Don't steal valuables. Um, the proper obedience itself was a ministry that people were going to be watching. He tells them to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Now, remember what he's talking about. Remember the people that are evil and gluttons and liars and the worst of the worst and the baddest of the bad? And he's saying we need to live godly lives in the midst of all of this. He doesn't say move to a better community. Get out of this liberal congregation and move over here to a more conservative group. He doesn't tell them to do that. He says, where you're at, where God has planted you, that's where you're going to shine. That's where you're going to do your very best work. You don't need to move to shine. You just need to shine where you're planted because that's your job. The, uh, when he tells them that we are looking for our blessed hope, remember that our blessed hope is what? Jesus Christ. Lord. There you go. I love that because some people get that mixed up. Some people get that mixed up and they believe our blessed hope is uh, heaven or seeing our loved ones again or all of these wonderful things that we're all looking so forward to. I haven't seen my dad in um, 30 some years. Man, I am looking forward to that day when I get to see my dad again. That's not my blessed hope. That's just, that's just one of the wonderful things that's going to happen for me. My blessed hope is that I'm going to stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we keep our focus on every single day. We are going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory with our loved ones in his presence. And that's the blessed hope. It makes everything that we go through in this life, every persecution, everything that hurts our feelings, everything that we go through in this life, it makes it worthwhile when we stop and think what's waiting for us. And that's what Paul is telling Titus here. 
Um, he says, he who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people who will be zealous for good works. That's the, the verse I chose as the key verse. The word um, that he translates here as special is really interesting. It's, um, it's a word, of, it's, I pulled it out of the Strong's, um, our Strong's Concordance, and it means one's own possession, specially set aside. It was oftentimes used for whenever there was a spoils of war, the king got to come in and select out of the first of the goods what he would choose and bring back to his own goods, and those were the special goods, the things that were chosen first, the cream of the crop, the best. And he says, that's what God has chosen, because that's what you are. You're the king's first choice. You're the one that he wanted. You're the cream of the crop. You're the special ones chosen in the possession of God. Chapter 3, he reminds them that the thing that we always don't like to talk about were to be subject to the rulers and authorities who are leading them to obey, to be ready for every good work. He tells them you're to speak evil of no one, be peaceable, be gentle, show all humility to all men. Um, just as he had with Timothy, Paul is now going to tell Titus to keep reminding the people to be good subjects in the civil sense. Now, why is that such a big deal? Why is it that we need to be good citizens? Why do we need to pay our taxes? Why do we need to follow uh, the rules on the road? Why do we need to do the things that our government set into motion for us to do? Why is that in the Bible? Because someone's watching you. People are looking at you all the time. And if we are to be good citizens of heaven, then while we are here in the place wherever God has placed us, and he's placed us in the very place that we're at, then we are to be good citizens here. We're not to be rebel rousers. We're not to be the zealots of biblical day. We're not to be out plotting the overthrow of the government. We're not to be out you know, uh, 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 protesting the things that the people have put in for our own good that need to be done. We're not to be dividing communities and congregations and people and things. We're not to be spending all of our time screaming and yelling with picket signs. What are we to do? We're to tell people about Jesus Christ. We're to tell them that something is waiting for them. And as we go along, that journey, waiting for that blessed hope, we are to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with every person we meet. And if you tick them off and make them mad because of some silly behavior, then you've lost that opportunity. And I'm just telling you, there is nothing more precious, more precious than your testimony to other people. Guard that with everything that we have. So, um, he tell, the last thing that he tells them in chapter three is he says, as you look out on all of these bad people, these evil, gluttony, lying, cheating, cretins that we're out there with, as you look out on them and begin to judge, remember you were just like them. Before you knew Jesus Christ, before you knew Jesus Christ, he says, we were all so foolish and disobedient and deceived. We served various lusts and pleasures. We lived in malice. We lived in envy. We were hateful and we hated one another. Now, maybe you don't think that all of those things fit you, but I bet you that somewhere along the line, some of it does. <laughs> And that's because that's who we are in our own natural instincts. Jealous, envious, greedy, not hospitable, not generous with other people, not kind, not loving. We're self-willed. 
we want those things that affect us. And however it affects everyone else, it doesn't even matter. That's who we are in our natural man in theme. But you know what changes us? Because somebody, somewhere along the line in your life, told you about Jesus Christ. Amen. They shared Jesus Christ with you. And he didn't just come in and make you a better person. He came in and made you a new person. Someone different. And all those things I just read, that's not you anymore. That's not who you are because you cannot be that person if the Holy Spirit is living within you. Do we fall back into that? Do we fail occasionally? Yeah, we do. But that's when the Holy Spirit pricks our hearts and we make the adjustments and we change and we grow. And that sanctification process mm -hmm. continues to work through us mm -hmm. as we become more and more Christ-like. So... We were all of those things, and the only thing that's different between you and the Cretans is that you know Jesus Christ. So if you don't like the way the Cretans act, then give them Jesus Christ. Share the Lord with them, and it will change everything. And to that we are saved to maintain good works. Um, and I'll end by saying this. Faith alone saves us. No one here has any doubt. Faith alone saves us. But the faith that saves us cannot be alone. It needs to be accompanied by what occurs when you have a change of heart. Good works can occur without salvation, but your salvation cannot occur without good works. There are plenty of people out there, philanthropists, who are doing good work in the world. Not to the glory of the Lord, just for their own means. But if you have true salvation in your heart and a true, uh, a true living salvation, good works will follow. There's just no other way around it. You become that better person. All right, good lessons for a young pastor as he begins to teach a difficult people.